Our scripture lesson this morning will be found in the book of Isaiah, in the 59th chapter, and we'll be reading from verses 1 through 15. That's Isaiah 59, and verses 1 through 15. Hear now God's holy and inerrant word. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear, for your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for the truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed a viper breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works, their works are works of iniquity, and the acts of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble, we stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgression and lying against the Lord, and departing from our God. Speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from hearts, from the heart words of falsehood, Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then Yahweh, or the Lord, saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Thank you. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. Please be seated. <coughs> Our text is from the last, the last uh, verse, and that is uh, verse 15 of what we just read. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Can you see this in our country today? Truth fails. And if you depart from evil, you become the enemy. You become the prey. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. You know, brothers and sisters, one of the attributes of God, primary to his very nature of who he is, is that God is just. He is perfectly just. You can't be God and be just a little just, right? He must be just. God is also righteous. God is also holy. And you cannot have holiness without justness, without justice. 
If God was unjust, he wouldn't be holy, and that's impossible. If God was unjust, he wouldn't be righteous, and that's impossible. So even a, a child's understanding of God knows that God is just. Now, quite frankly, we've talked before that the fact that God is just is good when we think of bad people we want punished, but it's bad when we think of ourselves as sinners and save for the blood of Christ that washes us, save Christ's imputed righteousness in our behalf, save the atonement where therefore he made us at one with God and paid the price for our sins. Because God's justice and God being just is not good for man because we're all sinners and the wages of sin is death. So thank God that God was not only just but merciful and therefore sent his only begotten son who died in our stead, paid the penalty for our sin and also lived a righteous life, a perfectly righteous life, doing what Adam our first federal head failed to do. Adam fell, and in Adam all died. Death came into the world through Adam. Life came into the world through Christ. So one of the attributes of God is that he's perfectly just. God is holy, and if he were unjust, he could not be holy. Uh, and therefore, we have, if you turn to 1 Peter, verse 15 through 19, <clears throat> first Peter uh, I said first Peter chapter 1 verses 15 through 19 and Peter says but as he who called you is holy you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you and if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious, precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So the message is, he who, since verse 15, since he who calls you is holy, you must be holy. And, and because it is written, verse 16, this is God speaking, be holy, for I am holy. That comes from Leviticus 11, 44 through 45 and 19, 2, 20, verse 7. So, so Peter is quoting the Old Testament and saying that God is holy. And, and by the way, isn't it interesting that, uh, that their unholiness, it says uh, that it comes from verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. You know, we need a whole new generation of fathers that, that if you follow them, you'll be, in, you'll be in good shape because we've all received traditions from our fathers that have been false traditions, traditions that lead away from God, that lead into the trust of man and the justice of man from man's perspective and all of these things. You realize the world today sees things like homosexual marriage as a matter of justice. It would be unjust not to do that. And uh, you know, so we've turned things upside down. Why well, it would be unjust to tell a woman that she can't have an abortion, you know, it would be violating her right to privacy wherever we come up with such things. But, but so justice has been turned upside down. You remember when we, we read in Acts 17, which is one of my favorite books of the whole Bible, one of the favorite chapters in the whole Bible. In Acts 17, uh, those who went to Nathan's house and, and arrested him and took him before the, the local court, they said, these men that have turned the whole world upside down have come here also, or in the AV in this, 
authorized version it says have come here thither I think is what it says but uh, but thither it's they've the guys that have turned the whole world upside down have showed up here in our neighborhood we got to do something about this and you realize that we do need to you know we do need to do this and we need to be that kind of person but really what we're trying to do is turn the world right side up but those that have a a vested interest in the things status quo see us as trying to turn their world upside down and therefore they hate us and, and do all in their power to be able to do it. But we need to be that kind of people because the status quo had the world like it was. But when Christ came and those that followed Christ, the apostles and then the believers, the world started to change. There started to be this this contested issue. You know, the Jews, even in their best days, never had much influence, really. Solomon had some influence as his reputation spread to the Queen of Sheba and places like that. But it was Christianity, when, when the Jews received Christ, and, and the first believers, Paul and others being Jews, they went out into the world and created a movement that spread very, very rapidly. And we need that, I would propose. Again, we need to be, we, we need to not be satisfied with just having our little conclaves where we come and sit and sing, church, sing songs and hear how much Jesus loves us and then go home and, and be part of the world for another week. We really need to have a church that will change the world, starting with where we are right here today. So, there's two things. I titled our message today simply, Justice. Justice is our message. And God is just, we've discussed. Now there's something else that uh, many of you use the authorized or the King James Version, and so I'll get into these. Uh, uh, very often when I say justice and when my new King James says justice, you'll be reading judgment, and we'll get into a definition on that uh, pretty shortly. But, but justice and righteousness are inseparable terms in the Scripture. Very, very often, I'm not going to give you all these, I'll give you the passages, I'm not going to try to read them all, but justice and righteousness are inseparable. Uh, justice has to do with doing what is just. And we are called to be just. Christians are called to be just. And righteousness has to do with right conduct. So doing what's right is doing what's just. Doing what's just is doing what's right. That's why they're inseparable. And many times, such as in Amos 5.4, you'll find those both words in the same sentence. You know, it's just a parallelism. So, if you want to see some examples of this, Amos 5.4, Genesis 18, 19, 1 Kings 10, 9, verse 9, 2 Chronicles 9, 8, and Psalms 89, 14, which was used, by the way, in Matthew 15. And Psalms 119, 121, and Proverbs chapter 2, verse 9, Isaiah 9, verse 7, which also was used in Matthew chapter 6, and Isaiah 56, verse 1. 59, verse 9, which is where we've already read today. Jeremiah 22, 15, 23, 5, Ezekiel 45, 9. So I, I, I give you this long list because I want you to know that this isn't one of those remote concepts that you find one place in the scripture, but it's a reoccurring, reoccurring theme, and it's not only in the Old Testament, but it's quoted in the New Testament as well. 
So justice and righteousness. The problem is that we are an unjust nation. We are a nation like unto what we read here in Isaiah. I should have kept my, kept my place. In Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Let's just see some of these, some of these some of these things that we have in common. Notice that the, that this chapter starts off with God saying, uh, or, or Isaiah saying, that behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. That's, you know, brothers and sisters, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changeth not, okay? He is always the same. And we cannot live like we're living, both in the church and outside of the church, without having God's ear be closed to us. He will not hear us when, any more than our children. You know, if your children disobey you and then they say, hey, why don't we go out for ice cream? And it's like, are you kidding? I'll give you a turnip, you know? Whereas no ice cream for you until your behavior changes, you know? So, so we live in a day where we wonder, well, how come God lets all this stuff happen? And it's like, I don't know why you don't understand this. Because God tells you all the time, okay? It's in here. It's in here. Throughout here, God declares it to you. He says, my arm is not too short to help you. I'm not helping you because you're in sin. You know, God, remember, God is holy. He is holy. And what uh, uh, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, what fellowship does... Uh, does light have with darkness, you know? And, uh, and let me just turn to it so I don't butcher it anymore here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. It's, it, it's uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Second Corinthians six. And that's where we read uh, <clears throat> that we are to be holy. Uh, starting in verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness, righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We're called to be holy. We're called to be separated. We're called to have no, no uh, uh, association with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather we're called to expose them, to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. It's our job. We're to live as just, holy righteous people and we're to ex exhibit that in our homes and in all that we do. <clears throat> so we're an unjust nation but we're also an unjust church. Uh, and I'm not talking about our church in particular, I'm talking about the Church of Christ, the body of Christ in the world, that, that uh, we either have sins of commission, <clears throat> sins of commission, are sins that you actually do. It's something that you do, that you steal, or you lie, or, or commit adultery, or abort your child, or whatever. But then there's sins of omission. And sins of omission have to do with what we should do that we don't do. 
that we should love when we don't, that we should care when we don't. A good example of that would be if you turn to Proverbs chapter uh, 24, <clears throat> and this speaks to the abortion issue, but it speaks to every other issue too because these are principles of the character of God and our duty. Proverbs 24, verse, starting with verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? It's a really important passage here. Obviously it speaks directly to the abortion issue. Uh, deliver those who are delivered toward death. Uh, the NIV, which I don't think very much of, as a matter of fact I don't like it at all, except one of the renderings of the NIV is in this passage, which is a legitimate rendering, is the NIV says, rescue those who are drawn toward death. So if you ever wanted to know where Operation Rescue came from, it's from this passage, Operation Rescue. Rescue is a legi legitimate uh, uh, rendering of the Hebrew word that's here. So my version says deliver. What did you say? Anything different? Deliver? Yeah, deliver, but nonetheless, the message is still the same. Rescue, deliver, deliver those who are drawn to death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. And, and then God answers us before we ever speak by saying, if you say, surely we did not know this, you know, we don't like to put abortion on television, and they're, they're hidden behind these, these uh, facades that say that it's a medical facility, you know, they usually, they never say abortion clinic, <laughs> you know, they always say a women's health center or a community center, something innocuous, you know, but if you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart consider it? If we say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know they were killing babies, you know, God says, you know and you did nothing about it. He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? So there's, so there's, it's, it stops all of our excuses. Yes, you do know, as much as they try to keep it off of television and not report on it, but you do know, and you do nothing about it. That's called a sin of omission. So there's sins of commission, there's sins of omission. There's a story of an old man, you know, we're supposed to love each other, we're supposed to show our love and speak our love to each other. There's a story of an old man that his wife says, we've been married for 45 years and, uh, and you haven't told me that you love me and, you know, since our, since our wedding. And he says, well listen, he says, if, uh, he says, if I ever change my mind, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, well, no use being repetitive here, you know. I told you I love you, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. But, uh, but anyway, we're not. To, but that's an omission. <laughs> he omitted to uh, to speak uh, words of love to his spouse, and so there's a lot of sins of omission. I'm sure that all of us can think of things we should do, uh, things that we sh uh, that we should have done that we didn't do as well as things that we did do that we should not have done. So sins of commission, sins of omission. Both have to do with, with uh, doing what's right and seeking justice. So first we have to be just. And by the way, we're also justified. We've been justified by a just God by the righteousness and the blood of His own Son. So, and so we have imputed righteousness and we have justification from sin because of the finished work of Christ. But the question remains, now that all this has been done for us, if we are true believers, if we are regenerate, new creations of God, should not we be just? Should not we seek after righteousness? Should we not seek after holiness and desire to be like our Lord? 
You know, he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to finish it. And in the day that Christ comes, we shall be like him. But that's a, a progress. It's progressive sanctification. Or by the, by the Holy Spirit, we're changing, we're moving, we're learning, we're growing, we're reading our Bible. I, I just uh, saw a quote from Spurgeon. There's so many good ones, but he says that a, a tattered, a, a worn out tattered Bible is evidence of a life that's not tattered <laughs> and, and, and all messed up, you know. So if your Bible's falling, oh, a, a Bible that's falling apart is evidence of a life that's not falling apart, you know. So it's a good, uh, good thing to remember. So I can't imagine people claiming to be Christians and they and they have no desire to read the Word of God. It just is does not compute. It is not logical. It's not reasonable. Such people are deceived. They're deceived. They have they they believe they're saved because of stuff that they heard, but the, but the evidence. You know, if, if the evidence is that we desire to worship God, we desire to feast upon His Word, we love it, we just love it, you know, we read it and we go, oh, and it convicts us, it comforts us, it does everything for us. So, I have, I'm going to break this into two different sessions, but, uh, but we are unjust both in the world, we're unjust in the church. In particular, sins of commission where the church literally does not speak, it does not act, it does not send its members out into the streets. You know, we have a little social club where we get together and we hear feel-good messages and we just go back home into the world. And we should be equipping you for your ministry and I'm not going to try to tell you what your ministry is. You know. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do that. They tell you to go knock on doors in this neighborhood for an hour, you know. But we don't do that. We have liberty. We have liberty in Christ. But we should have a desire to do something. We should have a desire to, to care for the sick or the poor or whatever the case may be. There should be fruit. There should be fruit in our life. We should be involved. And, and again, it is wrong for me to try to tell you what you should be doing. Maybe your calling is a prayer ministry and you're a faithful prayer warrior like Anna that was in the church, or excuse me, that was in the temple every day. A widow named Anna that was praying every day. I don't know what, what yours is. Maybe your gift is giving or praying or support or teaching or administration. There's all these different gifts. And so it's wrong of us to say, well, you should be doing what I'm doing, or what he's doing, or she's doing. But there should be evidence. And of course, there, there's not just one thing. We should care about a lot of things. I know I care about a lot of things, and I know the people in this room do too. We care about politics. We care about evangelism. We care about apologetics. You know, we care about government. We care about justice. We are people that care. And God cares, and it should show in us. So, uh, we have today, especially speaking of the federal government, all three branches, the, the judicial, the executive, and the legislative, that are corrupt. And I suppose it's possible that they could be more corrupt, but it's hard to imagine, you know, because all three of these have, have declared good. What, what God says is evil, they say is good. What God says is good, they say is evil, and, and it's literally, we have a world that's turned upside down, and we need to be those that, that work to turn it right side up. And I'll guarantee you, if you're trying to capsize my boat, I'm going to fight you. <laughs> so don't be surprised if they, if they fight. They're doing some crazy things today. Uh, just last week, it was discovered that that the United States Army, first off, they've been giving speeches declaring Catholics and Evangelicals to be suspect, people to watch out for, hate groups. But just this last week, the Army and all of its facilities blocked anybody from using the computers to go to the Southern Baptist Convention website. The Southern Baptist Convention is the second largest church. It's 16 million people, second only to Roman Catholicism. It's 
you know, it's, from our view, it's pretty mokto stuff, you know. It's just, I mean, they have a lot of tuna noodle casseroles and a lot of, and they, you know, and they, they do preach the gospel. But the army, the army had them blacklisted. It was a threat. There was an actual, you can look this up online because it's just last week. That the army, they had, if you tried to go to the Southern Baptist Convention website, they had a threat warning that came up that says, illegal, you can't go there. And, and you know what it is all about? It's because they're saying if you're opposed to homosexuality, if you're opposed to abortion, if you're opposed to uh, homosexual marriage, you know, then you are intolerant, you're a hate group, you know. This stuff is getting serious, folks, you know. When the army says, you can't go to the Southern Baptist Convention, we don't want anybody going there. It's an evil place. Now, I didn't read that in the article, but it's probably okay to go to the Playboy Club or something, you know. The, to go to some pornography site is probably quite all right because that's a matter of freedom. Don't you know the library in Janesville, you know, they got to let you go to pornography because that would be against freedom of speech and press if, you, if they didn't let you. But I wouldn't doubt if they don't let you go to any pro-life things or whatever. It's, it's crazy. Again, the world is upside down. But you and I, you and I are called to turn the world right side up. And we do it with power. We do it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do it because we know the truth. We love the truth. We exhibit the truth in righteousness and justness. And we declare it. And we do it with the power of God. See, we have this great advantage. If He is for us, the scripture says, who can be against us? That's called a rhetorical question. And what it means is nobody, nobody can be against us. Not Obama, not anybody. If He is for us, who can be against us? We have power. And in fact, we have power that is unused. Uh, unused power because we're so Number one, we're afraid of, of men. And number two, that we've got our tr trust and our confidence in things like political parties. We're thinking, or the Tea Party, or something that we've got our confidence over here, which always lets you down. It'll always make you say, it's not working right. It's not supposed to work right. It's not supposed to. What is supposed to work right is God's people obeying God following God, trusting God, having power that comes from God, not from, from opinion polls and numbers. So, <clears throat> I've, made a, I've made a list, and it's, a sh and it's a short list, and I know you can add to the list, but I've made a list of things that we, that, that in our country, that we are doing that are, that fit the category that we just read about of being unjust. Number one, and it should be number one on everybody's list, is the shedding of innocent blood. Nothing is more precious than blood on this earth. And to shed innocent blood, even from the Garden of Eden, when Cain slayed, uh, slew Abel, uh, God says that the, the blood of righteous Abel cried out from the ground. And, and if you be, read your book of Revelation, you'll find that, that the saints that were killed, the babies, and all those that are in heaven with God right now, that were, that were unjustly slaughtered, that they cry out, how long, O Lord, how long, before we are avenged? And they say, give it a while, give it a while, it's coming, and that's the truth. That's the truth. Nobody, nobody gets away with any crime. You know, you can blow up Boston or something, and, and maybe the guys got away and we never knew who they were, but God knows. Nobody ever gets away with anything uh, except for the, the time being. So the shedding of innocent blood. But let's look at uh, uh, Ezekiel 35. Ezekiel 35. Verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> this is uh, God speaking. Ezekiel 35, 5 and 6. Because you have, you have had an ancient hatred 
and have shed the blood of the children of Israel by the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, when their iniquity came to an end. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you, since you have not hated blood, therefore blood shall pursue you. Interesting passage, isn't it? Live by the sword, die by the sword, is another way to say it. Since you haven't hated the shedding of blood, I'm going to make sure that blood pursues you. And, and think about all the things that are happening in America. We have terrorist attacks, we have wars going on, we have explosions and bombs and you know, all kinds of things that are <clears throat> going on, hurricanes, earthquakes, all kinds of things that are shedding blood. And, uh, you know, if we don't care about the shedding of blood, we will see more shedding of blood. And it won't be where we don't care about it, it'll be where we do care about it. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be hit our house, our country, our nation. The president recently said, in speaking about gun control, and uh, the president said that if we can do anything to save the life of one child, we should do it. And of course, the question is, well, how about the 55 billion, or million, uh, children slaughtered in abortion clinics, thousand plus every single month, and you saying we should, we should care about the shedding of blood of one child, and I agree, would everybody agree? Yes, we should do everything we can to stop the shedding of the blood of one child. That would be just. But then if asked, if asked about the children killed in abortion clinics, or how about all the children that he personally is responsible for when he's got drones flying around the world, dropping bombs and shooting rockets into houses, having birthday parties or something, full of people, children, women, non-combatants, all trying to get one guy that's on their hit list. Well, that doesn't count, does it? See, God doesn't distinguish between innocent blood that we like and innocent blood that we don't particularly like. The, you know, wars themselves are an injustice in most cases because so many people die in, in the prosecution of a war. A lot of civilians die. America, shame on us. We bombed Dresden, Germany and killed a hundred thousand people. We didn't just bomb it, we firebombed it. We firebombed it and created a firestorm that was so powerful, so fast, that the people couldn't run from it. And it just went through the town and killed all of those people. It was not a military target. You know, we're, of course, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. You know, I just recently uh, was reading there and the, the fact that the Japanese knew that they were defeated, they knew that they had no hope, their air force was gone, their navy was gone, most of their military was gone, and they weren't stupid. They knew that they had no hope. And they had emissaries in Russia at the very time we dropped the atomic bomb trying to use Russia to talk to us to see how they could end this peacefully. So what we've always been told is, oh yeah, we would have lost a million men trying to take the island. But that's simply not true. They had no fuel. They had no oil. They had nothing. They literally were a surrounded island. And Japan has no resources. All of their oil and everything had to come from outside. So their factories were bombed and shut down. So I'm just telling you that, you know, we've done a lot of stuff ourselves that's not right. For some reason, when we, when we have drone strikes in other people's countries, that's legitimate. But can you imagine if somebody did one in our country? What if the Mexicans or the Canadians were after somebody and they used a drone strike in Dallas, Texas, you know? I mean, we would just be bonkers over that, wouldn't we? But we see nothing wrong. And by the way, this is to the sin of the church today, too, because Christians have become warmongers. We are supportive of unjust wars and uh, wars that are not declared, where nobody, they're not defensive wars. Nobody has attacked us. And yet we do preemptive wars. We're going to go over and attack this country before they can attack us. There is no support for that biblically at all. 
And so, so we have the church itself is guilty because you know what? Much of the church, the church that we know, the conservative church, not the liberals, but the conservative church has just decided that following the Republicans is going to get you somehow that equals righteousness. And it simply is false. It's simply wrong. And they're just what we're doing is just supporting a big military industrial complex and lives are lost as a result of these things. So calling, I have to hurry, so shedding of innocent blood. One of the interesting things is the two of the things on my list are covered by Leviticus 18. If you turn to Leviticus 18, we can get two birds with one stone here. <clears throat> This speaks to uh, homosexuality and abortion. Leviticus 18, 21 and 22. There we read, And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Moloch, nor shall you profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. By the way, passing your descendants through the fire to Moloch Moloch was a, a pagan god, and they used to sacrifice children, babies, to Moloch, and it was, and, and Israel did this to their shame. And in fact, we actually have in some museum somewhere a large metal statue of Moloch, and his arms are like this, held out in front of him. And there's a cavity in the back of the statue where they built a fire underneath Moloch and it went up, up the statue so that the arms got hot and they literally would put a baby in the arms of this Moloch and burn the baby to death. Horrible torture because those arms wouldn't kill you very fast even if they were red hot, right? It would be a slow, horrible death. How terrible! And so this is talking about, you shall not let any of your descendants through, pass through the fire to Moloch. Now when you sacrifice babies to Moloch, it's because you're trying to get something from your, from Moloch. You know, you're, you're trying to appease him or whatever. But how about us? You know, every baby that's killed in an abortion clinic is sacrificed on the altar of convenience. I'm not ready yet. Interfere with my life. I can't afford it. It's a sacrifice. The child is sacrificed that I might have a better life, you know, <clears throat> that I might not be inconvenienced, that I might not have to raise a child and be responsible for a child and all of that. <clears throat> and then verse, uh, verse uh, 22 of the same passage says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. <clears throat> And uh, so it covers uh, homosexuality as well. Many other passages, Romans chapter 1, uh, describes homosexuality in such detail that it is impossible for liberals to argue out of it. I mean, th this one they try to argue out of, you know, by twisting it, but you cannot twist Romans chapter 1 describing homosexuality and also calling it a curse. So we also have... Uh, you know, attacks against our ability to defend ourselves, attacks against the Second Amendment, and that type of thing. That's an unjust thing the government is doing. I've just been reading some interesting stuff uh, uh, on, uh, on the Founding Fathers, and, and you know, they had no interest at all in sport hunting or any of that. They were only thinking about a militia. That's, they were only thinking about, and the militia was all the men of the country, every able-bodied man. So they wanted every man to be armed, and the reason that they wanted every man to be armed is in case the government gets out of control. Because the Second Amendment protects the other amendments. Without the Second Amendment, you can't hang on to the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment or any of these others. But those are pretty much out the door too. And recently in Boston, we had literally a war state, all for one 19-year-old guy. And we massively bring these armies of quasi-military, because they're really not military, most of them, they were dressed like soldiers, but they were cops of all kinds, Homeland Security, 
And, and they've got the whole city under martial law, but martial law was not declared. That has to be from the government, it has to be from the governor or somebody to declare martial law. It wasn't declared, it was just de facto. Forcing people out of their homes, you know, out into the streets and searching your homes without warrants. And when you got ten people in your front yard with machine guns, you know, pointed at you, you know, it's, you know, it's a little hard to say, where's your warrant? You know, I think I would try it anyway, but, but anyway, you, you certainly are not going to win, you know, if they're determined to, to do that. But, uh, so anyway, and you know the thing that's really sad, Gary North talked about this, the thing that's really sad is you watch the newsreels and the people of Boston are applauding all of these, all of these stormtroopers coming down the road and all their military vehicles. They're waving little American flags, they're applauding, and that is totally, totally improper, totally unjust. It's government out of control. And it's coming to a theater near you. It's going to a neighborhood near you. So, unjust weights and measures. Uh, again, we can go to Leviticus 19 if you're still there. Verse 36. Let's start with verse 35. You shall do no injustice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, or volume. <coughs> You shall not have you shall have honest scales, honest weights, and honest ephah, and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Today, this of course would mean our money issue, which is not money at all. It's it's notes. We're using debt instruments in place of money, and they're actually irredeemable paper notes. You can't you know, the old paper notes used to be redeemable in lawful money at any bank or the treasury, but these bills that we pass around today are not redeemable in anything at all. They're just fraud. They're not a note. Because a note promises to pay somebody something at some place or time. But these don't promise to pay anybody anything anytime. So they're not really a note. They're just fraud. They're just fraud fraudulent notes, but we all use them, which which makes us complicit. And uh, next week, if you come back, if you're watching this or listening to it next week, I plan to talk about some remedies, but today I just want to make my complaint and uh, let God make His complaint, actually would be better to say. We have unjust weights and measures in our land. Uh, we have been robbed we have been robbed by our government and the Federal Reserve by printing paper money because we're trading our substance for their fraud. You know, we're trading corn, you know, trading manufactured goods, we're trading real things, our labor, our, our, our labor is our life, it's our property. We're trading that for junk. And the only reason we do it is because we think we can pass the old maid card off on somebody else. The grocery store still takes it, so I'll still work for it. But we've been slowly robbed to death over the years by doing that. So we'll talk about something to do with that too. We've destroyed the common law. Uh, you know, the, the scripture says that there should be one manner of law for you and for the stranger within your gates. I've been noticing this for a long time. Uh, treating people as, uh, you know, sending them to Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay and everything, denying them counsel, denying them uh, lawyers and representation, all these things. Now I understand in the military, you know, you capture a guy and you can, you can have a court-martial or whatever, military trial because he's a military guy fighting a military guy. The, 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 but, but nonetheless, in, in a lot of cases, we are treating people differently in this country. And I know this is going to make people mad at me, but I have been, look at Leviticus 19.33 and Ezekiel 47, 21-23, and think about this in the case of, in the case of, uh, of uh, what we call illegal immigration. So first off, Leviticus 19.36, it says, Oh, we've already done that. Well, that's the unjust weights and measures. Uh, 1933, if you go back to 33, it talks to one manner of law. <coughs> Verse 
Verse 33, And if a stranger dwells among you, you shall, you shall be, excuse me, the stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You got that? The stranger that's, that's among you, you should treat him as, as if he were somebody that belongs here. And then let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel 47. I'm going to have to finish. Ezekiel 47, verses 21 through 23. Like I said, I know this is going to get me in trouble. I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm reading it in God's Word. Thus you shall divide this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. Remember, this is Ezekiel. It's a long time after the conquest of Canaan. These guys have been slaves. They've been carried away captive, and now they're back, and they're going to divide up land again. It shall be that you will divide it by lots as an inheritance for yourself and for the strangers who dwell among you and who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. They shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. And it shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells, there you shall give him his inheritance, says the Lord God. Now, one thing that's even more prevalent in the scripture is that there should be one manner of law for you and for the stranger within your gates. It's throughout scripture. One manner of law. We're not to mistreat people. We're not to treat them because they're poor or any other reason. We're not to, to do that. So one manner of law. And in America today, we have a lot of different ways I could say it. But one thing is that for the rich, there's one manner of law. And for the poor, there's a whole different manner of law, which is no law at all, no justice at all, no hope of any justice, because justice is for sale in America. And we'll talk more about that next next week. I wanted to get into uh, to s some really interesting things, but we've, we've run out of time. But the rest of my little list here, and we'll take this up again next week, is a compelling medical treatment. We're forcing people to have treatments that they don't want for them and for their children. There's a couple in California that just this last week, uh, they had their baby, a six-month-old baby, in a hospital, and the hospital recommended a treatment. They said, we want a second opinion, so they decided that they would go get a second opinion, and the state came and took that child away from them. Okay, when the, you go to that hospital, the doctors say this is what you ought to have for that child, you're, you're, you're in trouble, you're in trouble. And of course, preventing us from having natural treatments that we would prefer, forcing inoculation and vaccines on people that don't want them, uh, controlling what we eat or drink. Think of raw milk, which is good for you. It's been, you know, it's a baby still drink it today, and they all agree that it's wonderful, I think. But, uh, but anyway, they're, they're, you can't have raw milk. The government's telling us to do that. So there's a lot of things the government is doing. Again, you could add to my list, but God is not pleased when we are unjust, when our government is unjust, and we personally need to be just and righteous and holy, and we need to stand for that. So let's pray that that may be so. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for helping us to get our mind uh, set straight, uh, that we might understand what is good and what is bad, because you declare the things that are right. Help us that we might desire to live by your word, no matter what our neighbors and friends do. Uh, help us, Father, that we might be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So we thank you for your word. We pray your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen.